Christine, we're here today to talk about the four control layers of a wall. But before we get to that, can you tell us a little bit about what we're trying to achieve with our building assemblies? I think the easiest place to start is to think of the building as an environmental separator. So what we're trying to do is to create a particular set of interior environmental conditions that may vary, sometimes substantially, from the environmental conditions outside. And to do that, we need to separate the inside from the outside, and we need to do it in a way that's durable and low maintenance. So to accomplish those goals, we use the four control layers, water, air, vapor, and thermal control. Right. Can you tell us about a common wall and how the four control layers are used? Yeah, so the outermost material we've got is our cladding. And a lot of times people don't consider cladding to be part of the control layers, and technically they're not when we're speaking in theory. But the cladding actually has a really important role in terms of um, the function that we want to achieve in that it protects everything else behind it from particularly impact and UV, but it's also water shedding, which is super important in that it reduces the amount of water that our water control layer, which is located behind it, actually in fact sees. So in between the two, we usually like to include an airspace. And the airspace is for drainage and also for drying, for ventilation. And those two things are super important. It is the single most effective, least expensive way of ensuring that your control layers, particularly your water control layer, performs as designed and as intended. At Fine Home Building, we always refer to that as a rain screen gap or a ventilation space. Correct. And that can be created with furring strips or battens, uh, spacing your siding off your wall, or a three-dimensional drainage mat. Exactly. We need to set ourselves up for success with a watershed and cladding and some sort of space, however we end up achieving it in between the cladding and the, the, the start of our control layers. Okay, so the big reveal, what's the water <laughs> control layer? Okay, so we have some sort of material that we're gonna want to include to, and actually in fact the code mandates that we have some sort of provision for water control, and its job is to protect all of the moisture sensitive materials behind it from excessive wetting. Now, What's kind of crazy is that its job is not to prevent all of the materials from any wetting. We're really in the water management business, not, in t not the water blocking business. So that's important when we start to consider what kind of water control layer we want to, we want to use and how we wanted to detail it, that kind of sure. stuff. I think it's important to note that in North American construction, it is usually most helpful for us to use the same material that we use to control water to also be the air control layer. So when we're talking about our water control layer, typically it's not just our water control layer, it's our water and air control layer. And there are basically three categories of product that we can use to, in fact, accomplish this. So the first are the standard mechanically attached membranes, and the classic is 15 pound felt or 30 pound felt, or now it's number 15 felt or, or number 30 felt. Uh, but those membranes are mechanically attached. So there's a lot of holes in them, and then we put even more holes in those when we attach our cladding, which is fine from a water management perspective, but if we puncture a lot of holes in something and it's not fully bonded to the sheathing that's behind it, what might work great as a water control layer doesn't work as well as an air control layer. Even if these products are technically marketed as air barriers, the second you put a bunch of holes in things, it reduces their effectiveness. So there are two other categories of water and air control membrane that tend to perform much better from an air control perspective while still serving that water management function. And those are fluid membranes and self-adhered membranes. And those are applied directly onto the face of the sheathing and they're fully bonded to the sheathing. Now we'll still have faster penetrations, but you know, we still have to attach our cladding, but because they're fully bonded, it's not like one fastener connection is, has an air connection to another one 16 inches away, right? They're fully bonded to the substrate, and that's really significant when it comes to air control. And then the third category of product are these integral products where you have sheathing that is coated in the factory with a water and air protective coating, but it's, it's the same material. So you've got an integral sheathing plus water and air control material, and all you're doing in the field is taping the seams. The most common example of that is zip, um, but there are commercial examples as well with, that are gypsum-based, not, not wood-based. But typically in houses, we see OSB-based integral 
materials. So if builders want to get great air control and they're using a mechanically fastened membrane for their water control, they can tape the sheathing seams and then apply the mechanically fastened um, water control layer. Is there anything wrong with that other than it's extra steps? No, and it really depends on what your preferences are. So sometimes we're not in a new construction setting, we're in a retrofit setting, and we might have a system that's working fine from a water management perspective, but we want to improve air control and we don't have the luxury of doing that on the exterior. So you can try to achieve air control on the interior by taping your drywall, or you can use spray foam. I, I mentioned that it's usually most convenient when the water and air control are coming from the same material. But it doesn't, you're absolutely right, it doesn't have to be that way. You can get your air control from something else. So taping the sheathing joints would be one, spray foam would be another, interior drywall would be another. But the most common approach is to use the same material for both. And we get the most performance out of the second two categories of material. So not the mechanically attached membranes, but the either the fluid applied, the self-adhered, or the um, integral type products. So we still have two controls to get to in this wall. Okay. Yeah, Vapor right. and thermal. So the next step in our typical standard two by six cavity insulated wall, we've got our insulation. So our insulation is provided in between the, the studs and we can use all kinds of materials to insulate. Uh, so fiberglass bats are a very common choice. Um, we find though that with fiberglass bats, we sometimes have a, the, that delta between typical installation and perfect installation tends to be very big. So there are other types of products that um, tend to fill that gap a little bit better and insulate as a result uh, a little bit better. So blown cellulose, for example, tends to fill the cavity a little bit better. But we can also use spray foams, you can use mineral wool, there's lots and lots of options with respect to the thermal control layer. But most of the time, the place we put it in a standard wall is in that cavity. But it's obviously we've got some discontinuity in it. It's interrupted by the studs. An alternate that improves performance would be to include exterior insulation in addition to this cavity insulation. And typically that insulation goes outboard of our air control layer and our water control layer. So we've got cladding, airspace, exterior insulation, water and air control, sheathing, cavity insulation. The last layer in this wall would be on the interior and it would be a uh vapor control layer. Correct. So a lot of times our interior painted drywall serves double duty. It's our interior finished material, but it's also our vapor control layer. So it reduces the likelihood that warm interior moisture laden air will travel through our assembly and hit our cold sheathing, if, assuming we're in a cold climate, and uh, cause condensation to occur. So having painted interior drywall reduces that just enough to keep us out of trouble, and the exterior drying through the sheathing and through our water and air control membrane gets us the rest of the way there. So we limit wetting and we provide enough drying to where we don't have any problems. Um, now, in some places, even that's not enough, right? If it's very, very cold, we can't provide enough drying. So we either need to use exterior insulation or we need to do something more robust on the interior to limit interior moisture, reduce how much interior moisture can reach that surface. And the most common example of that exactly. is polyethylene, but that's also a very rigid vapor retarder that may be best used only in the most extremely cold climates. So what are some other options for interior vapor control that fall somewhere between your painted drywall and polyethylene. In any building that's air conditioned, you want to avoid polyethylene. If you're not air conditioning in the summer, this may be a moot point and you're, you can use polyethylene. But if you're air conditioning your building, you end up creating the reverse problem, right? Our, the polyethylene is completely impermeable and it's cold in summer, so you get warm exterior air that goes through your wall and condensation will occur on your polyethylene and because it's completely impermeable, zero drying occurs. So. Um, you are much best served finding an alternative to that approach if your building is air conditioned. Now fortunately we have lots of alternatives. So if your code will accept painted drywall, use painted drywall, don't do anything else. If your code does not accept painted drywall, craft face bats work just fine. It's inexpensive and it works great. Um, alternately, you could use a smart membrane in that location. These are developed specifically for this purpose and they still permit interior drying in the summer while limiting wetting in the winter. So they solve our wintertime problem without creating a new summertime problem. So it sounds like the average code built wall is pretty good. 
Yeah, standard two by six cavity insulated wall is a thing of beauty in a lot of ways. You wanna stay away from interior polyethylene in any building that you are air conditioning, and you really wanna make provisions to provide drainage and ventilation between your cladding and your water and air control membrane. And you'd improve the wall by? Adding exterior insulation.